Hello everyone, and happy Halloween, if it's still Halloween when I post this. This is Sam of Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, and now also on Spotify, as per listener request. So I want to start now my discussion of Myth of the Month 18, Robin Hood. And I've been reading pretty intensively about the Robin Hood mythology for the past couple weeks. And there's a great deal to say about it, so this is going to be more than one lecture. And some will be posted publicly on SoundCloud for the public to hear, and some will be posted on Patreon for patrons only. But to start off my talk about Robin Hood, I want to start with an incident that actually just happened earlier this year. So many of you may have heard of the stock trading app called Robinhood, which was launched in 2015 and which was named Robinhood in order to claim that it would challenge the growing dominance of the stock market of a small circle of big firms and hedge funds. And so calling this app Robinhood, on which small traders could trade stocks commission-free, evoked a sense of populism, of the underdog challenging the powers that be. Yet, there's no necessary reason why such a stock trading app would take anything away from the rich or from the big players of Wall Street. It simply allowed a way into the game, for whatever that's worth, for smaller traders. Nonetheless, last winter, in the winter of 2020 to 21, some people on message boards and forums on the internet did come up with a scheme, a way that they believed they could get some of these big hedge funds to pay out to these smaller traders. And the strategy was to coordinate their buying and buy up stocks that these hedge funds had bet against, such as famously GameStop. And when this trend gained steam, eventually some funds were actually forced to buy out small traders at very high rates in order to try to disinvest from these bad bets. And as this started to happen, eventually the people who run the Robinhood app stepped in and simply halted trading of GameStop. And this incident seemed to confirm many people's perception that the whole game was rigged and in fact was controlled from the top. And this seemed to betray the very idea of the so-called Robin Hood app. And naturally there was an outpouring of anger and controversy online, including on Twitter, about both the buying trend and then the shutdown of trading by Robin Hood. And it happens that on January 28th of this year, a Twitter account with the handle at Robinhood issued a statement on Twitter saying, quote, Lovely to have all these new followers. Can we just check that you know that you're following the Worldwide Robinhood Society in Nottingham and not the Robinhood app? If so, a big welcome from Sherwood. Clap, clap. So I think that this little humorous interchange that culminated with this statement by the Robin Hood Society in Nottingham illustrates a lot of ironies, and it shows how the very name of Robin Hood has basically been boiled down to a brand and a sort of easy shorthand for anti-establishment rebellion, and that it can easily be overlooked that even as this brand is used to kind of sell products with a veneer of populism, it's easy to forget that the name actually comes from a legendary bandit with a very complicated and multi-layered mythology that has been passed down and developed over many centuries, and that the meaning of this figure of Robin Hood has changed dramatically through time. So, for example, to go back more than 500 years into one of the earliest definite references to the idea of Robin Hood as a bandit. In the year 1441, a group of yeomen and laborers in Norfolk in England formed a mob and set out on the roads and waylaid passengers, robbed them, chanting, quote, We are Robin Hood's men. War, war, war. 
So clearly there's something with a somewhat sharper edge going on here when actual highway bandits are chanting that they serve Robin Hood and call for war. So this is not simply an anti-establishment gesture, but it represents a set of ideas connected to real violence, defiance, and rejection of all law and order. And the very idea by this time of Robin Hood was widely feared by elites as representing the menace of chaos and rebellion. But it's interesting, despite this dramatic difference in meaning, these bandits in Norfolk in 1441, like the modern-day app developers, also invoked Robin Hood as a brand. But they invoked the figure in order to make rebellion seem meaningful or legitimate, as opposed to trying to make a for-profit business seem rebellious. So there's a kind of ironic reversal here. So what I want to do now, basically, is discuss what the earliest form of the Robin Hood legend that survives, that we can still see today, what it says about Robin Hood, who he was and what he stood for, and how the mythology then has evolved and how the figure and image of Robin Hood has changed through the centuries. So I'll do that in this first part, and then if there is time, I'll also discuss what more specifically Robin Hood represented and symbolized back in the 1400s at this time when the earliest surviving written documents about Robin Hood come from, and try to analyze the social and moral and spiritual themes in the early Robin Hood legend. And this discussion will necessarily be incomplete, regardless of how far I'm able to get through it. It will be incomplete since it necessarily overlaps with the question of the real origins and inspiration of Robin Hood. Where did the figure of Robin Hood come from? Was he a purely literary invention? Was there a real historical Robin Hood? Or was he originally a mythological figure, a descendant of the woodland spirits and gods of the pre-Christian past? So that's a question that I will leave off till later and post that discussion on Patreon for patrons only. But first, I want to talk about the early legend of Robin Hood, roughly who was Robin Hood and what did he do in these surviving medieval stories, and how the legend has evolved from there. So to begin with, the earliest stories and ballads about Robin Hood and his men come from the mid-1400s, or at least those are the oldest ones that have ever been found to this day. And these early Robin Hood texts number seven. There are seven surviving that are believed to date to before the year 1500. There is one long narrative poem called A Jest of Robin Hood, or sometimes A Little Jest of Robin Hood, which is a, a long and involved narrative with many incidents. Then there are five shorter ballads or narrative songs and one fragment of a theatrical play. And in all of these surviving stories of Robin Hood, there is some consistency to the setting. They take place in two main locations. So as you probably know, Robin Hood is believed to be an outlaw who lived in the woods and robbed on the roads. And the two wooded areas where he's said to be based are firstly Barnsdale, which is simply a rugged, hilly, wooded region of South Yorkshire. So that's in the northeastern interior area of England. And it happens that Barnsdale lies near a stretch of the Great North Road, the main artery that used to run from London to York and then up to Scotland. The other main setting is Sherwood Forest, which is probably the more famous one that you've heard of, and that is a royal forest belonging to the crown in Nottinghamshire, just north of the town of Nottingham. So that is also, roughly speaking, in the interior northeastern area of England. And those two locations, Barnsdale in Yorkshire and Sherwood Forest in Nottinghamshire, are not too far apart. They're about 20 miles apart which in the late Middle Ages would have meant basically you could have traveled between them in a day if you were traveling very quickly on horseback. 
As for the time when these stories are set, it's fairly clear from social environment and incidents that they did not take place at the time when they were written down. So although these earliest Robin Hood stories are from the mid 1400s, it seems that they took place in probably the late 1200s or early 1300s. So they were already a tale of, you could say, recent history or a, a vaguely remembered past. So what do these seven surviving early stories of Robin Hood actually say about him, about his band of merry men, and their exploits? What do they do? Well, the two earliest surviving tales are, as I mentioned, A Jest of Robin Hood and a ballad called Robin Hood and the Monk. And both of those texts were written down in the mid-1400s, maybe around 1450. So they give us the earliest window into what people were actually saying about Robin Hood and his career as an outlaw. So if we look first at A Jest of Robin Hood, which is by far the longest early text about Robin Hood, it is divided into eight fits, or sort of short sections, that could be recited individually, like kind of like episodes in a recurring TV series. And these eight fits fall into basically two halves. There's a first half with the first four fits and then a second half, which discuss different incidents at different times. So the first half of A Jest of Robin Hood begins by describing Robin and his men, including his main lieutenant, Little John, in the forest, specifically in the woods of Barnsdale. And it describes them going out to the road to capture someone to bring back as a sort of forced guest at their feast. And this apparently is something that Robin Hood repeatedly does. He wants guests to come and to, to entertain and to rob. And so they snare someone on the road. And the person they first pick is a knight, which seems promising because knights are usually wealthy. But this one looks crestfallen and sort of ragged. And they bring him back to their lair in the forest and try to rob him, but they find that he is broke. He has almost no money on him. And the knight explains that he has lost all his money trying to defend his son from an unfair legal charge. And his friends have abandoned him, and he's had to mortgage his lands to the church and is in danger of losing them and becoming truly destitute. So Robin Hood and his men pity the knight, and they decide to make him a loan of 400 pounds, with which he can then pay back his debt to the church, and they ask the knight to come back in one year and repay them that loan of 400. And the knight promises to do so, and he invokes the Virgin Mary as his surety, or guarantee that he will repay. So the knight sets out on his way, and little John goes with him to escort him as his squire and takes him to York, where the knight then makes his payment to the abbot of St. Mary's, the churchman to whom he owes this debt. The abbot is very disappointed, since he had been hoping that the knight would not repay the debt and he'd be able to seize the knight's lands. But the knight does make the repayment, and then he goes back home to collect money from, presumably from rents, to pay the loan back to Robin Hood. Now, in the meantime, in the intervening year, other episodes happen that the author weaves in. So Little John, who escorted the knight back uh, to York, then goes down to Nottingham. And in Nottingham, he enters the service in the Sheriff of Nottingham's household under a false name. He adopts an alias and conceals that he's in fact one of Robin Hood's men. While he is there, Little John gets into a fight with the cook of the Sheriff's household. He finds that the cook is a very strong fighter that he can't defeat. And so he recruits the cook then to join Robin Hood's men. So Little John and the cook steal a bunch of the sheriff's silver, go out back to the forest and rejoin with Robin Hood. And Robin Hood comes up with a scheme. He enlists the cook to go back to the sheriff, pose as a loyal servant and lure the sheriff out to the forest to hunt. So the cook does so. He brings the sheriff out to the woods and lures him into a trap. He is captured by Robin Hood and his men. 
And again, he is forced to dine with them, to sleep in their encampment with them, and forced to swear friendship, to act as a friend of Robin Hood and no longer try to hunt him down. And on those conditions, they let the sheriff go back to Nottingham. Meanwhile, after all this has happened, Robin Hood is still waiting for the knight to show up and repay his loan of 400 pounds. And eventually the the deadline rolls around. Robin Hood is getting very anxious. He's waiting by the road and he sees a monk from the Abbot of St. Mary's coming down the road. So the same monastery that had initially made the first loan to the knight and tried to seize his lands. So Robin Hood waylays this monk, shanghais him back to his forest headquarters, and robs him of 800 pounds. So, you know, an enormous sum of money for that time, which would have been remarkable for a monk walking down the road to be carrying. And Robin Hood takes this as a sign. Remember, the surety that guaranteed repayment from the knight was the Virgin Mary. And this monk is from the Abbey of St. Mary. So Robin Hood takes this as a divine intervention that shows that his loan, his debt has now been repaid. Afterwards, the knight does show up kind of at the last moment. The knight returns looking good, happy. He brings Robin a gift and he brings back 400 pounds. But Robin says, no, that debt was already repaid. So it's now canceled and you can keep your 400 pounds and everyone parts ways happily as friends. So that's the end of the first half of the jest. The second half involves another series of incidents where the sheriff now takes the initiative. So the sheriff is furious at Robin Hood for humiliating him, and he decides to break his oath of friendship to him, and instead he holds an archery contest at Nottingham, knowing that Robin Hood, as a brilliant archer, will not be able to resist entering the contest. So Robin Hood and some of his lieutenants, including Will Scarlet and Little John, enter the tournament incognito, right, disguised. But Robin Hood is recognized and the sheriff's men attack him and try to capture him. And Robin Hood's gang are just barely able to defend themselves and fight their way out. They flee to the west and they take shelter at the castle of the knight, who is now specifically named as Richard at the Lee. So the knight to whom they made this friendly loan is now their ally. They take shelter in his castle. The sheriff tries to besiege the castle, but is unable to take it and has to withdraw, which then allows Robin Hood and his men to sneak out and return to the forest. Meanwhile, the sheriff goes to the king for backing to ask for authority to capture and kill Robin Hood. But even before he gets this permission or authority, he instead finds the knight out hunting and kidnaps him. So the knight is now in distress and the knight's wife goes and summons Robin Hood for help. And Robin Hood's group is able to track down, they are expert hunters, and they're able to track down the sheriff, rescue the knight, and kill the sheriff. So this is the first instance in the early stories where they kill the sheriff. It it happens again. There's more than one sheriff to kill, apparently. So after they kill the sheriff, the king naturally resolves that he must find and confront Robin Hood and stop this source of violence and disorder. And he goes around the north trying to track down, chase down, and capture Robin Hood from one forest to another. But they keep eluding him. So finally, the king... A king's forester advises him that the way to catch Robin Hood is to dress up and pose as an abbot, and that this will lure Robin Hood out because he hates rich monks and abbots. So he does so, he disguises himself as an abbot to act as bait, and Robin Hood comes out and waylays the king, taking him to be an abbot, and takes him back into the forest. And he finds that this abbot is remarkably witty and personable. They hit it off. They engage in games and witty conversation. And eventually Robin Hood recognizes the king and kneels and asks for pardon from the king for his crimes. And the king promises him a pardon on the condition that he enter the king's service. So he transfer his great skills from crime and robbery to service of the royal court. And Robin Hood negotiates an agreement and goes into service at the king's court as a forester 
and he serves for 15 months in this role but eventually he finds that he is bored with courtly life he's broke he's had to spend all his money on fine clothes and so forth his friends and followers are abandoning him and returning back to the woods so eventually robin hood asks for a leave to go back and visit the greenwood and once once there he decides to stay and return to the life of the outlaw and he blows his horn regathers his band and lives for another 22 years in the greenwood as an outlaw and finally at the end of the jest there is a brief summary of a final episode that's just briefly sketched out about how robin hood dies so according to the jest robin eventually falls ill and he travels to kirkley's in west yorkshire in order to seek treatment from his kinswoman, who is the prioress of Kirklees, and Kirklees is a real priory that really existed in Yorkshire. But the prioress betrays him and bleeds him to excess until he dies, and he is buried at Kirklees Priory. So that's the earliest surviving complex story and narrative of Robin Hood and his exploits. And it clearly was woven together from more than one pre-existing story. Different episodes have been linked together into an attempt or a gesture at a sort of grand, complete, canonical story of Robin Hood. But as I said, there are other surviving, shorter ballads about Robin Hood from about the same time or a little bit later in the 1400s. And these are called Robin Hood and the Monk, Robin Hood and the Potter, Robin and Gandolin, Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne, and Robin Hood's death. So as for Robin Hood and the Monk, this one seems to be from about the same time as the jest of Robin Hood, around 1450. And this one works differently because the plot is set in motion by Robin Hood himself. So one day Robin insists on going into Nottingham in order to attend a church, hear mass, and pray to St. Mary. And he takes with him only his lieutenant, Little John, as a guard. Even though he's warned that he should take a company of fighters with him, he goes only with Little John. Robin and Little John have a fight along the way. And so Little John turns back, and Robin Hood goes on alone. So while worshipping in the church, a monk recognizes Robin Hood and alerts the sheriff and his men, who come and capture Robin Hood and imprison him. So meanwhile, back in the forest, the men learn about what's happened, and Little John and Much, the miller's son, who are two of his men, set out to try to rescue Robin Hood. And first, on the road, they encounter the monk who had turned Robin Hood in in the first place. They kill him and his young page, and they take his clothing and his letters and seals. So then, with this disguise and these stolen letters, they go to the castle of Nottingham, gain entry, kill one of the guards, and free Robin Hood. And Robin Hood and Little John then return back to the forest and make up along the way. Then from slightly later, maybe around 1460 or so, there is Robin Hood and the Potter. And in this one, Robin Hood himself again sets the action in motion and also takes on disguise. So Robin Hood on on the road attacks a potter who is traveling with his pots to go to the market to sell his wares. And Robin tries to charge him a toll or a fee and the potter refuses so they fight and they fight until a draw. Robin Hood is unable to defeat him and so Robin asks the potter to make an alliance with him and help him fight against the sheriff of Nottingham. And the potter, for whatever reason, finds this idea appealing. So he agrees to lend his clothes and his pots to Robin Hood, who then goes to the market in disguise as the potter, sells off the pots at a very low price, and then gives some of them as a free gift to the sheriff's wife in order to curry favor. And he is invited then to dine at the sheriff's household. Once there, Robin Hood tells the sheriff that he knows the outlaw Robin Hood and knows his location. So he wants, obviously, to lure the sheriff out into the woods in order to entrap him. So Robin Hood, in disguise, leads the sheriff out into Sherwood Forest and leads him into an ambush. The sheriff is taken prisoner, forced to dine with them, and all of his money and weapons are stolen from him. 
And Robin Hood then sends the sheriff back out to Nottingham along with a gift of a palfrey or riding horse to give to his wife. So Robin Hood liked the sheriff's wife, found her to be smart and personable, and so sends along a gift. And eventually the sheriff gets back to his house in Nottingham, and the wife laughs at him, saying, well, now at least we've paid for the pots that Robin Hood gave to us. And further, Robin Hood pays off the potter, and they go on on their way as friends. Then from about the same time or a little later, maybe the 1470s, there is a brief fragment of a ballad called Robin and Gandolin, which is very strange and difficult to parse out. And it's disputed and uncertain whether this fragment is actually about Robin Hood or not. This main character is only called Robin. And Robin and Gandolin are both champion archers, and they compete with one another. But then Robin is killed by attackers of some sort. And it seems that Gandolin, who has now become a friend, an ally of Robin, tries to avenge Robin's death. But that's about all we can extract from this fragment. Then finally, the last two ballads of Robin Hood that survive are from maybe the 1480s or 90s, and they both survived in a collection of manuscripts called the Percy Folio that was found hundreds of years later in a house in Shropshire. One of them is Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne. This is another sort of strange tale that seems to have gaps where the manuscript might have been lost or cut off. And it starts with Robin Hood having a dream in which he is attacked and cornered by two yeomen who have strange appearances and strange clothes. And he's disturbed by this dream, and so he sets out alone to try to find these men that he saw in his dream. And eventually he does find a man in the woods who is dressed in a horsehair cloak, complete with mane and tail. And he ascertains that this man is a bounty hunter, who is seeking out and trying to kill the outlaw, Robin Hood. So Robin Hood very carefully engages with this man, holds an archery contest with him, as of course he loves to do, and then eventually reveals his identity and fights this man, who we now know is called Guy of Gisborne. It's a very rough and brutal fight. Robin Hood is nearly killed, he's on the ground, And he prays and invokes the assistance of St. Mary, who apparently then intervenes and gives him strength, allowing him to kill Guy of Gisborne and take his cloak. So Robin Hood puts on the horsehair cloak, cuts off Guy's head, sticks it on the end of his bow, and with a knife mutilates the face of the head so that it is unrecognizable. And then he returns back towards his encampment to look for the sheriff and his men, whom he surmises have been attacking his encampment in the meantime. And he finds a disastrous scene where two of his men have been killed, Will Scarlet is fleeing, and Little John has been captured and tied to a tree for execution. So posing as Guy of Gisborne, Robin Hood approaches the sheriff and asks for a reward for his service of killing Robin Hood. He claims he has now taken on the disguise. He claims to be Guy and claims to have killed Robin Hood. And as a reward, he asks for permission to kill the prisoner himself. So he's granted this request. And of course, instead of killing Little John, he cuts his bounds and sets him free. And the two of them then turn on the sheriff's men. The sheriff himself turns away to flee, and while he is fleeing, Little John shoots him in the back, in the heart. And that is where the story ends. And it's unclear if that is the real end of the story or if maybe something else is missing from the surviving text. So along with Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne in the Percy Folio, there also is a sort of fragmentary ballad, possibly with pieces missing, called Robin Hood, His Death. And in this story, it takes place when Robin Hood is old and sick, and it seems basically to agree with the ending of the jest of Robin Hood. It just gives more detail and describes his journey out to Kirkley's Priory to seek help from the prioress, his cousin or kinswoman. Along the way, he sees a woman on a bridge cursing the name of Robin Hood, 
We never get an explanation of why or what's going on. He then encounters another group who are mourning and weeping for Robin Hood, as if he's already dead. Eventually, he reaches the priory, seeks help from the prioress, who bleeds him, and Robin Hood, after it's too late and he's already lost a great deal of strength, he realizes he's being bled too much and that the prioress intends to kill him. He calls for Little John, tries to escape, but the prioress's lover, Roger of Doncaster, charges in and attacks Robin Hood. They have a brief fight, but of course Robin Hood is already weakened and he dies. And in his last moments, he launches an arrow out the window, and at the site where it lands, Little John has him interred. Probably this story arose as a myth to explain why the grave of someone named Robin Hood is on the grounds of Kirkley's Priory in West Yorkshire. So those are all the surviving early ballads of Robin Hood from before about 1500. And some of them were first found in manuscript, like in the Percy Folio. Some of them were first printed many years later, such as The Jest of Robin Hood was printed in the early 1500s. And then finally, alongside those, there is also one surviving manuscript fragment of a play, a little theatrical piece that seems to have the same basic plot as Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne. It involves a fight in the woods between Robin Hood's men and a bounty hunter, presumably Guy of Gisborne. And it mentions among Robin Hood's friends and followers, it mentions Friar Tuck, who is a sort of renegade friar living as an outlaw in the woods. And so this is the earliest indication we have that there was understood to be some connection between Robin Hood and Friar Tuck, and that Friar Tuck maybe was part of his gang, but it's very unclear from this fragment. So that is the basic rundown of what we can say about Robin Hood's exploits, his career as an outlaw, as it was told in the 1400s, in the late Middle Ages. So how did the legend evolve from that, from that odd series of incidents in the forest or in Nottingham, into the legend we know now of the heroic outlaw who robs from the rich and gives to the poor. Well, it's clear that the stories and songs of Robin Hood were fairly widespread and popular in different parts of Britain by no later than 1500. But there is a geographic oddity about where the stories were popular. So it seems that the tales of Robin Hood, even though they all take place in the north of England, they were widespread and often referred to in southern England and in Scotland. So basically everywhere in Britain except where the region where they take place. And it seems that people embellished them and developed them over time as representing their idealized or romanticized or stereotypical image of the north of England as rugged and wild and full of outlaws and adventure in contrast to the more urbanized and settled south of England. So in the late 1400s, from the 1480s up to 1500, there are early records of certain churches, especially in southern England, sponsoring plays and pageants that involve various folkloric characters, including Robin Hood. And it's clear that there were people who dressed up and performed as Robin Hood in these plays and pageants. So Robin Hood, almost from the very earliest we can find in the records, Robin Hood is a character that people impersonate. And this tradition developed especially in certain towns west of London, such as Kingston-on-Thames, where it became an annual tradition to put on shows and plays of Robin Hood. And from those towns, it then spread out over much of southern England and Scotland, so that it was basically a universally recognized character by 1500. And around that time, in the early 1500s, the pageantry of Robin Hood and his men became connected to the May Games. And those are the yearly spring festivals around May Day, which were based originally, drew from the ancient Roman tradition of Floriana, the spring festival celebrating life, renewal, and sexuality, especially virility. And you may think, for example, of the traditional maypole and the dance around the maypole on May Day. Well, the maypole is a phallic symbol associated with virility 
And in this period, in the Tudor or Renaissance period, it became customary also for the young people or even the young and old people of a village or a parish to go out into the woods, to sort of go into errands into the Greenwood to begin the celebration of the May Games. And there's actually a description from a minister named William Stubbs from the 1500s describing these May Games with horror. And he describes how they would begin, quote, all the young men and maids, older men and wives, run gadding overnight to the woods, groves, hills, and mountains, where they spend all the night in pleasant pastimes, and in the morning they return, bringing with them birch and branches of trees to deck their assemblies with. I have heard it creditably reported by men of great gravity and reputation that of forty, threescore, or a hundred maids going into the woods overnight, there have scarcely the third part of them returned again undefiled. So it was clearly understood that these May games and these journeys into the woods involved sex. And they would then, as Stubbs described, they would be followed by a return journey into town, carrying flowers and green boughs to decorate the church and the town. And over time, these games developed and incorporated more performance, impersonation of mythic figures, and pageantry. And it became customary to elect a May king and queen. And it's unclear how far back this tradition might go, but it was clearly common in the 1500s for the revelers to elect a May king and queen who would preside over the May games, kind of like the Lord of Misrule who would preside over carnival in the Middle Ages. And there were two new developments. By the mid-1500s, there were two important new developments that were common in the May games. And one was money raising or fundraising. So when the host of young people coming back from their sex in the woods would bring back greenery and flowers, they would then sell them, sometimes very aggressively or forcibly sell them to the townspeople, as well as little decorative objects like ribbons and pins. And the money from these sales would be collected and given to the church wardens for a poor relief fund. And this function of the May Games, of raising money for the poor relief, became increasingly important in the 1500s because that was a time when poverty and inequality were growing. And so this kind of performative charitable fundraising could serve as a sort of band-aid for the increasing impoverishment of the peasantry and laborers, especially in the countryside. And it seems that by the late 1500s, this selling of trinkets to raise money could be pretty forceful to the point that it's really difficult to distinguish it from simple theft. And the May Games maybe just served as a sort of pretext or rationale for the poor of the town to steal money from the rich gentry elite. So that was one. The fundraising was one important development in the May Games in the Renaissance. Another was the adoption of specific characters or personas for the May King and Queen. So rather than just saying we've chosen a young, handsome, virile man to be the May King, they would instead specifically say he is Robin Hood and he would have to dress up and act like Robin Hood. And the May Queen usually was identified as Maid Marian, which is a sort of woman of the woods, a huntress woman, who is seen in French folklore and was personified in French sort of country plays called pastorelles, which then were probably brought over from Normandy into England. So you have these two different folkloric figures of Robin Hood and Maid Marian, who are increasingly identified with the May King and the May Queen. But they were still understood as two separate characters. For instance, there's a famous line from an English poet from the year 1500 where he's describing these May games just when they're starting to catch on in England. And he says the people of the village like to put on, quote, a merry fit of Maid Marian or else of Robin Hood. So it was still seen that these were two different characters, each with their own mythology, and you would perform a play or a song of one or the other. And Robin Hood was clearly the same Robin Hood who's spoken of in the ballads and tales. He was associated only with men, and he and his host were purely male. 
and they would go about as a kind of gang, forcefully collecting donations, or in quotation marks, donations, for the church fund. And many church records from the early 1500s record large gifts to the poor relief fund from, quote, Robin Hood. And this process is probably the origin of the idea that we've all heard today, that Robin Hood steals from the rich and gives to the poor. It was from his personification and his role in this sort of ritual of the May Games. It is not referred to in the early ballads. He never has any interaction with the poor. The poor, the peasantry, the destitute simply don't show up other than the impoverished knight. And Robin Hood steals because he likes to steal. It's, it's what he does. He's a robber. Uh, there's no sort of higher moral explanation to it, at least not that aspect of his crime. It doesn't have any higher moral purpose in the ballads, but it starts to receive this moral meaning and this connection to charity through his role in the May Games. Through this process, the legend of Robin Hood is increasingly moralized and Christianized, but it is still very ambiguous. How do you understand the significance, the purpose of this pageantry and personification of Robin Hood in the May Games in the 1500s? In a way, you could see the story of Robin Hood and this tradition of dressing up and acting out the role of Robin Hood. You could see it as a kind of release valve for social tensions and frustration. It gave people a sort of safe process and safe rationale for venting some of their envy or resentment towards the rich gentry. And so it's not surprising that it's often been debated right down to today in modern times. It's often been debated to what degree did the Robin Hood legend undermine the social order? Is the legend of Robin Hood subversive? Or, on the other hand, does it help to maintain and bolster law and authority by allowing a sort of temporary fantasy outlet, the fantasy of robbery, of rebellion, which can then be contained within this ritualized festival? And I think it's important that this sort of ambiguity really runs through the whole life of the Robin Hood mythos. And if we think back, for example, to that incident I mentioned before in Norfolk in 1441, when men went out on the roads, robbing passersby and chanting, we are Robin Hood's men, war, war, war. Was that band a true threat to the social order, or was it just a moment of letting off steam where frustrated young people could sort of act out a fake rebellion. And there's ambiguity as to the causation. How does an event like that unfold? Did people first emulate and impersonate Robin Hood and then as part of the fun go out and turn bandit and, and mock rob people? Or was it the reverse? Did people actually go out in order to turn to the life of banditry and robbery and then invoke Robin Hood as a kind of gloss or explanation, a byword for the persona of the outlaw? We really don't know. But regardless of that deep ambiguity, by the mid-1500s, the story of Robin Hood and his career was really proliferating now all around Britain, especially with the explosion of the print industry and rising literacy. And printers ran off thousands of broadsides with short poems or songs or verse plays about Robin Hood. And most of them were in some way connected to the idea of Robin Hood in the May Games as the, the May King, the King of Spring. There also were others connected to the May Games, stories, ballads, little plays involving other characters like Maid Marian or Friar Tuck, but they tended to be separate. Only over time, gradually through the 1500s, did these different characters get woven together into one mythos, right? one narrative world. And the first one was Friar Tuck, and Tuck was probably based on a chaplain named William Stafford in Sussex in southern England, who in the year 1417 abandoned his post as a chaplain, went out and gathered a rebel band, and took the alias of Friar Tuck. And that's the earliest reference anyone has found to that name, and so it may be that that's where the story and persona of Friar Tuck originally came from. 
and he became the subject of his own cycle of stories as a sort of mischievous outlaw churchman in the woods. And he was adopted into the May Games, probably as a sort of substitute or adaptation of an older Scottish idea of the Abbot of Unreason, a sort of crazed churchman who presides over uh, a world turned upside down during the spring festival. So Friar Tuck takes up that role as kind of the Abbot of Unreason. And he has his own cycle of stories, but there is some hint that early on he was connected in some way to Robin Hood and his world. And for example, in that uh, play fragment from the 1470s, he is mentioned and connected in some way to Robin. And then later in the 1500s, a ballad was composed called Robin Hood and the Kirtle Friar, which provides the sort of backstory of how Robin Hood and the Friar first joined up, where Robin Hood goes and challenges the Friar to a fight. The two of them fight in midstream. The friar is able to dunk Robin Hood in the water. It has a sort of biblical overtone. It's reminiscent of the baptism of Christ by John the Baptist, but, you know, in this sort of mayhem parody form. And so that provided the explanation of then why you see Friar Tuck in Robin Hood's band. And this is the same sort of pattern that was used over and over, where as more and more characters are adopted into Robin Hood's world, like Alan Adale or the Pinder of Wakefield, a story is composed where Robin Hood meets them, fights with them, fights to a draw, and then recognizing their prowess and their skill invites them into his band, and some accept and some decline. And of course, this is then the explanation that is further given for Little John, his relationship with Little John, where they supposedly fight with staves on a bridge. So that's the pattern that people use, or the sort of device that ballad composers use in the 1500s to pull more and more different characters, some of which probably already previously existed in folklore, into Robin Hood's band. The last one to go through this process, or the last significant one, is Maid Marian. So Maid Marian comes in to the Robin Hood mythos even later, and she's only gradually woven in in the Elizabethan age after 1560. And at first, when she appears in the Robin Hood stories, Marion is seen as a fighter and a hunter, just like the rest of Robin Hood's band. And like the other characters, her first meeting with Robin Hood involves a fight. And then only later in the 1590s does Maid Marion change into what we think of as a noble woman, a lady somehow connected to the king, and a love interest of Robin. She sort of becomes his damsel in distress. And she is used as bait to lure Robin to Nottingham. And in this way, it's clear that Maid Marian served to take the place of the Virgin Mary, right? So whereas in Robin Hood and the Monk in the 1400s, Robin Hood goes into Nottingham and comes into conflict with the Sheriff of Nottingham because he wants to pray to St. Mary, in the plays and stories written after 1590, that role is taken by Maid Marian. She is the woman who will give out the prize to the best archer, and so she is used as bait to lure him out of the forest. And in the late 1500s, these evolving stories enjoyed pretty wide popularity. There was a growing variety of different stories and variations with different characters, but there also was the beginning of an elite crackdown where the May games and including the stories and plays of Robin Hood were seen as disorderly, subversive, impious. There were a lot of clerical complaints. Uh, many ministers can be seen complaining that their parishioners would rather hear stories of Robin Hood than come to mass or matins. And he set up sort of in opposition to proper religion, which is somewhat ironic considering the content of the early stories that emphasize Robin Hood's piety and his frequent holding of masses. And an early site where all of these processes happen, the sort of elaboration and complexity of the myth and the beginning of crackdown is in Scotland. So the stories have been popular in Scotland from early on. They're mentioned in historical chronicles in the early 1400s. There are Scottish versions of these ballads and plays. But in 1555, 
the Scottish Parliament outlawed the choosing of a Robin Hood. So this ritual of electing a young man to be the Robin Hood of the town or the parish, this is specifically singled out and prohibited by the Parliament. But possibly for the first few years, this wasn't really enforced. It would be an awfully difficult order to enforce. But in 1560, a hardline Protestant faction called the Lords of the Congregation seized control of the government in Edinburgh, and they probably began a more serious crackdown on the Robin Hood plays. And this touched off a massive riot that threatened the social order in Scotland. So in 1561, the apprentices of Edinburgh rioted. And it was not uncommon for apprentices, sort of young laboring men who often were very exploited and unhappy. They would sometimes rebel, walk off the job, etc. And the May Games may have provided some outlet right, for their frustration, their rebellion. But when those were cracked down on in 1560 and 61, it began a riot. And there was a massive riot where apprentices seized control of the section of Edinburgh around Netherbow. Some of them marched around the town carrying swords and armor, possibly we might imagine impersonating Robin Hood and his men. And this was seen as a plain rebellion, an act of mutiny against the government. And so many of these revelers were arrested, and one of them was sentenced to death. So this was part of a, an increasing crackdown, especially in Edinburgh. But later, the May Games did start up again, including Robin Hood, in the 1570s, before they were then effectively suppressed. But they still continued a bit longer in the towns of Lothian, in the countryside around Edinburgh up until the 1590s and didn't really die out until around 1600 or so. So 1600 was an important turning point where the role of Robin Hood in England and Scotland shifted, where increasingly the clergy and the government really frowned upon and tried to suppress the celebration of the May Games and the legend of Robin Hood and Maid Marian. But at the same time, more highbrow artists, literate playwrights, poets, started to take up the story of Robin Hood and give it a more kind of elevated and respectable tone. So it shifts, you could say, from folk or popular culture into high culture. And this eventually gives rise to what we now think of as the modern legend of Robin Hood. And a really important watershed was in the late 1590s when the English playwright Anthony Munday wrote two plays called The Downfall of Robert Earl of Huntingdon and The Death of Robert Earl of Huntingdon. And in these plays, Munday casts Robin Hood as simply an alternate alias or persona of a nobleman, Robert the Earl of Huntingdon, who has been deprived of his rightful inheritance and sort of takes to the outlaw life to try to reclaim his rightful title and estates and to fight against tyranny. And it's very likely that Monday based elements of this story on variations of the Robin Hood legend that he learned from Scotland. Monday puts great emphasis on the romance with Maid Marian and Robin Hood's enmity with his romantic rival, Guy of Gisborne. So now Guy of Gisborne isn't a villain just because he's a bounty hunter who wants to kill Robin Hood. He's also a rival for Maid Marian. It's a love triangle. And furthermore, the story is set clearly in the reign of Richard I in the 1190s. And the chroniclers, and I'll talk about this more in the patron-only lecture, different medieval chroniclers mentioned Robin Hood, and they put him at various times in the 1200s. But this play selects the reign of Richard I in the 1190s and casts Robin Hood as a partisan and supporter of the rightful king Richard against his usurper brother John. So this is a way, again, of sort of moralizing and you could say sanitizing Robin Hood's outlawry by giving it this noble purpose and a noble title to go with it. 
So some popular stories and ballads of Robin Hood, more in the old-fashioned style, did still circulate in the early 1600s, but they tended to be more and more toned down in terms of their violence, more Christianized. They put a greater emphasis on charity and less on the violence and anarchy of the early stories. And they adopt the consistent convention of placing the action in the 1190s with Robin Hood as a supporter of Richard the Lionheart, a partisan of his cause while he is in captivity in Europe as against the brother Prince John. And so Robin Hood now appears not truly as an outlaw, but as a loyal subject and ally of the rightful king. So by the mid 1600s, you can see, as I mentioned in my lecture on Hinduism, you can see this strange close convergence of the Robin Hood legend with the Ramayana, which also centers on an archer who is exiled into the woods, denied his rightful inheritance, who has a consort in the Ramayana that is Rama's wife Sita, and sets out to rescue Sita from an evil usurper, and who then along the way restores the rightful king to the throne, which of course in the Ramayana is Hanuman, and in Robin Hood's story is Richard. So this raises the question of why and how it happened, that by the 1600s, there is this kind of close concordance between the Robin Hood mythology and the Ramayana. Is this just a coincidence? Is it just the result of two different groups of people trying to take a story of a forest outlaw who is a great archer and moralize it by giving it some sort of legitimate message and story arc? Or is it possible that there is a connection between the two? Could knowledge of the Ramayana have come back to England by the end of the 1500s? There was already by that time a long-standing Portuguese colony in India at Goa, and so some degree of knowledge about India had made its way back to Portugal, mainly through traders, merchants, and also the Jesuits. And Portugal was a major trading partner of England. There was a special alliance between England and Portugal. So it's possible that maybe some sketchy outline of the story of the Ramayana made it back to England. Also, the first English merchants to travel to India went in the 1580s and 90s. So really right at the same time that this modern version of Robin Hood was emerging. So maybe somehow English traders, emissaries, adventurers, in India learned about the plotline of the Ramayana. You know, it's, it's an epic poem in Sanskrit, so there's no way that they were exposed to the original. But as I said before, the Ramayana is customarily performed in pageants and plays, especially during the festival of Diwali. So it's very much conceivable that a visitor could have become aware of it and interested in the story. And perceived that the plot line lent itself well to plays and pageants of Robin Hood, of a, an outlaw archer in the forest. So through Anthony Munday's plays and through later ballads and plays in the 1600s, the Robin Hood story took on more or less the form that we're familiar with today and then basically froze in time at that point. And that's partly because there was a renewed and intense crackdown in the 1600s. As Puritans came to power in England, the May games were aggressively suppressed. The performance of Robin Hood ballads slowed down. It didn't disappear, but it slowed down and went gradually out of fashion, especially with the new print literature and the literature of vernacular poetry and Shakespeare and early novels that became more and more popular in the 1600s and 1700s. So in the 1700s, there was, you could say, a low point where popular interest in the Robin Hood legend, the elaboration of new stories or characters, where this really went into abeyance, and it became a subject of only limited antiquarian interest. So certain sort of hobbyists, such as an Anglo-Irish bishop who went and found and published the Percy Folio, that he found in a house in Shropshire in 1765. This is how new material about Robin Hood came to light at this point, was basically the discovery of older material by interested antiquarians. It was no longer really a living tradition. 
But nonetheless, even if we see the 1700s as a low point, there was definitely the beginning of a revival by the end of the century. And it started especially in 1795, when an antiquarian named Joseph Ritson published the first book-length collection of Robin Hood ballads. And this collection included some very old texts like The Jest of Robin Hood that had not been printed in 250 years. And Ritson was a new kind of antiquarian. He was something of a radical. He had had a sort of romantic, nostalgic interest in the Jacobite movement. And during the French Revolution, he also had Jacobin sympathies. He was part of the new British radicalism. And he was interested in kind of popular and peasant resistance, and also in a national folklore. So you could see him as kind of an early figure, a pioneer of this romantic interest in folk culture as a basis for radical politics. And he set the tone for a new pattern that emerged after 1800. So Robin Hood by that time was largely forgotten among the common people and popular culture, but romantic intellectuals started to revive it. So in 1818, the poet John Keats, you know, an early genius of romanticism, composed a poem sort of lamenting how Robin Hood had been forgotten. And the irony that you'll see, of course, is that the poem itself was part of a revival of interest in Robin Hood. And in this poem, you'll see he mentions the Morris Dance, which was a ritual dance performed during the May Games and often involving people impersonating Robin Hood and Friar Tuck. And he also mentions Gamelin, which was a tale, another verse tale of an outlaw leader that dates back to the 1300s and in many ways is similar to Robin Hood. So Keats is sort of lamenting the loss of this folk tradition, and he says, Gone the merry Morris din, gone the song of Gamelin, gone the tough belted outlaw idling in the green shaw, all are gone away and past, and if Robin should be cast sudden from his turfed grave, and if Marion should have once again her forest days, she would weep and he would craze, he would swear for all his oaks fallen beneath the dockyard strokes have rotted on the briny seas, she would weep that her wild bees sang not to her strange that honey can't be got without hard money." So this is sort of a classic romantic statement where Keats is lamenting the loss, as I said, of this folk tradition, and also, in parallel with that, the loss of much of the forest and woodlands of Britain, where people used to be able to live by hunting, by gathering. As, as he alludes to, it seems Maid Marian was associated with honey, the gathering of honey. And all of this has been lost in favor of a commercial and imperial modern Britain, where the the oak trees have been cut down to be made into ships for the navy and commodities like money you can no longer gather in nature, but you have to buy them. So this is a classic sort of statement of longing and a casting of Robin Hood as now a representative of the sort of lost old Merry England, the simpler, more wild, more natural England. And this plays right into the new Romanticism and then later into Victorian neo-medievalism. And Robin Hood gets taken up into novels, poems, plays, craft art like stained glass. He's celebrated by some of the same Romantic and Victorian writers who also started the Arthurian revival. So people like Walter Scott and Alfred Lord Tennyson. And just two years after Keats's poem, in 1820, Walter Scott published the prose novel Ivanhoe, which casts Robin Hood as this kind of romantic symbol of chivalry. Right? He's, he's now got this chivalric cast to him and as a champion of the downtrodden Saxons against the Norman oppression. So he gets co-opted also into the rise of Anglo-Saxonism, this political Anglo-Saxonism that holds that the liberties of Englishmen are rooted in the Anglo-Saxon past and their struggle against the Norman yoke. So he serves all these new convenient purposes. And you can see a parallel with, as I, as I said, with the Arthurian revival, and it plays to similar tastes, similar kind of nostalgia but still, the Robin Hood mythos has a kind of rougher and more populist edge to it than Arthur. 
And ultimately, in the modern age, I think the Robin Hood revival ultimately outstrips the King Arthur revival, and it penetrates deeper into sort of ordinary popular consciousness. And one of the reasons, I think, along with this sort of more populist and rebellious edge, the Robin Hood mythology is also easier to stage. It's not as fantastical as the tales of Arthur. There isn't the magic and sorcery. The setting is very simple. It's the woods. It's easy to set up a backdrop of some trees. And this probably explains the easier transferal of the Robin Hood mythos into film and television. Indeed, I, I would venture to say that Robin Hood now is one of the most coveted and desired roles in film. In 1922, Hollywood made a successful silent film of Robin Hood with Douglas Fairbanks, the sort of original, you know, swashbuckling action hero. And then in 1938, I would say the, really the one major classic film about Robin Hood was produced called Adventures of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn, who was understood to be kind of the natural successor of Douglas Fairbanks. And it was really the most iconic role of Errol Flynn's career. It made him a superstar. And it also is the most definitive depiction of Robin Hood to date. You know, when people think of Robin Hood and the green tights and, and the cap with the feather, it is largely through the image, the imagery of this, you know, brilliantly staged early Technicolor film from 1938. And of course, Robin appears in the movie as a dashing, charming freedom fighter who is protecting the Saxons against a wicked conspiracy by the Norman barons. And it's been very hard for other later films to measure up, but there have been many other movies of Robin Hood aimed at sort of different tastes and audiences. A significant one a lot of you have probably seen is the 1973 Disney cartoon film where the characters are different animals and Robin Hood is cast as a fox, which is appropriate, right, for someone who is wily, a master of disguise, clever. And it this movie confirmed a sort of new trend in the later 20th century of seeing Robin Hood as essentially a children's tale, you know, alongside, say, the Grimm's fairy tales. And this version, of, of course, is also heavily sanitized and moralized. But in the last 30 years or so, there have also been attempts to bring back a sort of grittier vision of Robin Hood. Like in 1991, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, which is a firmly mediocre film, overwhelmingly pompous and serious, uh, with very little sort of sense of mischief or fun. Uh, and this was parodied, of course, two years later in Mel Brooks's Robin Hood, Men in Tights, which also is, for the younger generation today, one of the definitive images of Robin Hood, just as with the King Arthur mythos, once it had sort of reached a point of exhaustion, the great successful defining movie is Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which is a send-up of the whole mythology and how self-serious and even sanctimonious it is. In 2010, there was another somewhat less successful attempt with a Robin Hood movie starring Russell Crowe. And this movie followed the current trend of greater supposed realism. The style and look of the movie is very rich and also dark and gritty. And as the critic Robert e Roger Ebert said, it reflects a sort of loss of a sense of magic and fun in connection with Robin Hood. And several years later, in 2018, there was another Hollywood film of Robin Hood, and this one was a commercial flop. I have not seen it. I don't, I don't know whether it's any good or not, but it didn't get very far. And this is aside from enormous numbers of novels, children's books, and TV series. There, It's really too much to count. Robin Hood has become a kind of stock material for television in a way that no other medieval tale comes close to. Now, as this pop culture Robin Hood has exploded, it's, of course, emphasized certain themes, like his support for the poor and his opposition to tyranny. And so it's perhaps not surprising that in the 20th century, there's been some scholarly interest 
in Robin Hood as a kind of social or political symbol. And especially in the 1950s and 60s, certain radical scholars, including Marxists like Eric Hobsbawm, have taken up Robin Hood as representing social banditry or peasant resistance against exploitation. They have often connected Robin Hood to the peasant uprising in England in 1381. And this idea was repeated by the historian Morris Keane in his book Outlaws of Medieval Legend in 1961, where Keane sees Robin Hood as an appropriation or reworking of outlaw stories for a plebeian and peasant audience to sort of express their social critique against the social order. But this argument was then rejected by later scholars like Stephen Knight and J.C. Holt. And these later historians have pointed out that the stories as we see them, the early stories from the 1400s, emphasize Robin Hood's yeoman status. And they argue that the stories had a yeoman audience, sort of men of middling status, of independent income. And they point out, quite rightly, that none of the early surviving stories show any interest at all in peasant concerns. No peasants appear. There is no interest in problems of rent or villainage or high taxes. And rather, this is entirely a story of men of middling and upper status contending over personal issues. Whatever peasant aspects there are to the story are overlain later and were part of the later moralization of the story. They're not there in the medieval original. Still, despite this scholarly debunking of the idea of Robin Hood as a sort of peasant rebel or a representative of social justice, nevertheless, the popular image and usage was irreversible. And the name Robin Hood is increasingly used as a byword, not just for rebels, but also for charity. And in 1988, at the height of the sort of first Wall Street bonanza stemming from the Reagan-era policies and deregulation, a stock trader formed a new organization called the Robin Hood Foundation, which would supposedly aim at fighting poverty in New York. And this foundation still today holds potlatch-like fundraisers in which super-rich people, mainly uh, stock traders and managers of major hedge funds, also real estate developers, contribute funds of money, which then are supposed to be used to create affordable housing projects, in quotation marks, affordable housing in New York. But these projects are often run through private groups that still make money. Uh, they And they are used, although it's a tiny fraction of the enormous billions of profits that are made on Wall Street and by hedge funds, this little stream of money sort of laundered through the Robin Hood Foundation is able to give an appearance of charitable beneficence and hence to kind of blunt the push for public housing. So I think this is another example like the Robin Hood app of how the, this image of Robin Hood the bandit can now be invoked to kind of give a veneer of beneficence or even anti-establishment spirit to basically what's either just profit-making commerce or very small-scale charitable gestures. Okay, so if that is a basic rundown of how this medieval outlaw figure ended up evolving into the freedom fighter and champion of the poor that we know today, let's go back then to this earliest surviving image of Robin Hood that we see in the surviving medieval ballads and say, what did Robin Hood represent in that time, in that world? And I want to discuss the symbolism and the themes behind the stories in this earliest surviving version. And is there something about these Robin Hood stories that can account for the endurance and success of the legend? the fact that we are still talking about him all these hundreds of years later. So I want to begin an analysis of the early legend of Robin Hood from the Middle Ages 
and I probably will get into some of these themes and then cut it off and pick up the story then in the second lecture, which will be posted for patrons only on Patreon and which will also discuss the possible origins of Robin Hood and the question of whether there was a historical Robin Hood. So as I mentioned before, when we look at the early surviving Robin Hood stories, they fall into two basic groups or clusters with different sorts of content. Firstly, there is the Yorkshire-based group, which take place mainly in Barnsdale, the wooded area of South Yorkshire. And these are more centered in the woods. More often, Robin Hood remains in the woods and dispatches his men out to find sort of targets or captives. These stories are generally less violent, and in these stories, Robin Hood's main adversary is the church, particularly the Benedictine order. Then there is the Nottinghamshire-based group, which take place in and around Sherwood Forest and the town of Nottingham. And these stories are structured differently. Usually Robin Hood sets out from the forest on adventures and excursions and engages his enemies. These stories are more violent and the main antagonist is the Sheriff of Nottingham. Now, we can't know for certain, but there are reasons to suppose that probably these two sets of stories were originally two different groups with different origins, and that they were gradually merged together in the 1400s. And the big example of that we can clearly see is in The Jest of Robin Hood, which clearly involves different stories and storylines being woven together, and sometimes there are smooth transitions among them where they're sort of skillfully woven and sometimes there are abrupt jumps where a character like say little john is left off in york and then suddenly the next time we see him he's in nottingham and it seems as if these different stories that take place 20 30 miles apart are being kind of jumbled together so where did these different stories originally come from and how and why were they assembled together into this one mythos? I'll leave that and talk about that later in the last part on the patron-only lecture. But clearly the main unifying through line of them all, of course, is the character of Robin Hood, who is the archetypal outlaw and a yeoman. And it's clear that he is understood to kind of embody the persona of the outlaw. And there were many outlaws in medieval England. Many people took to the roads or the woods and took up a life of robbery and banditry. But Robin Hood somehow perfectly encapsulates people's most idealized, most romanticized image of the outlaw. And you can see that particularly in his name. The name Robin Hood is almost too perfectly constructed to be the name of an outlaw. For one thing, the name Robin includes the word rob in it, as in robbery, and even with the in at the end, it almost sounds like the gerund robbing. And then his last name is Hood, obviously, which, as many people have pointed out, evokes the wood, and he's closely linked always to the green wood. His name could almost be read as echoing Robin of the Wood. It also is very close. The, the H sound can be confused with the W sound, which are often connected in, in the English language, W and H. Also, it's very close to good. And repeatedly in the ballads robin and his men are called good good men or good yeomen so you could read it as sort of evoking robin the good as well as robin of the wood but the last point which i haven't seen any other scholar point out is that his surname is hood which also is a word with a meaning in english and there are references into the in the poems to Robin Hood actually pulling a hood over his head as part of his disguise or his subterfuge and pulling it off when he wants to reveal himself. So it evokes this whole game of hiding, concealment, disguise. He is Robin the Hooded as well as Robin of the Wood and Robin the Good. It's also very clear and it's a, a strong through line through all the stories that he is a great master of archery. He has a sort of stupendous, miraculous talent of aiming his arrow. 
And archery had a certain significance in medieval England. It had always been part of hunting and of warfare. So a good archer is a good fighter and a hunter. But it was particularly associated in the late Middle Ages with yeomen, especially foresters. So sort of paid salaried servants who managed forests for their aristocratic or royal patrons. And an archer had a lower status than, say, a knight, right? A knight who is skilled with hand-to-hand -hand combat on horseback, but was still respectable. And so the art of archery was appropriate, you could say, to someone who aspired to a sort of middle respectability, something higher than the peasantry, but not as elevated as the noble fighters. And yeoman archers were fairly widespread, and the, the art of archery was encouraged and taken up by many free commoners in England in the 13 and 1400s, which is right at the time when these stories probably were being developed and written down. And yeoman archers were credited with many important English victories of that era, such as the victory at Crecy in France in 1346, where English archers were able to decimate the French nobility. So yeomen and archers could be seen as sort of new, rising, ambitious groups who were building up their status, in a way, in late medieval England. So Robin has an extraordinary virtuosic skill in archery, but when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, he's only so-so. He does not have skill reaching anywhere near that of a knight. So he has brilliance and precision, but not enormous, overwhelming strength. Right? And this fits in then with his general personality, where he shows cleverness, deception, accuracy. He's a master of disguise, but he is not a superhuman, powerful figure. He doesn't use brute force. Rather, he's mercurial. And you can see in his persona a sort of strange juxtaposition, which is appropriate maybe to the classic outlaw or bandit. And it's a juxtaposition of violence and brutality on the one hand and courtesy on the other. There's this kind of bipolarity in his behavior, a contradiction, you could say, between his generosity and his rapacity. And as you can see in the stories, he often forcibly takes people captive in his lair, but he then treats them with great courtesy and generosity. And he sometimes also acts as a judge, judging the honesty and honor of other people. He, one of his common tricks is he likes to ask people how much money they have, then search through their purses and pockets. And if they've told the truth, simply let them go on their way. But if they have lied, then take the excess. So if someone says, oh, I only have 10 pounds, and they actually have 80 pounds, Robin Hood will take the 70 pounds of excess and then leave them the 10. So he's sort of like a trickster testing their honesty, their truth telling, while at the same time he himself lies constantly. He's a master of deception. And you can see in Robin Hood's exploits, in the way that he targets people, takes them captive, tests them, judges them, there's a definite note of sadomasochism, of this sort of charming, charismatic figure who likes to toy with people and show his power over them. Now, of course, around Robin Hood is the outlaw band, this assemblage of mostly anonymous characters who follow Robin's lead, but always include some named known recurring figures that come up through the different stories. And the most consistent one, of course, who always appears is Little John, his sidekick, who is ironically called Little John because he's very big and tall. The band also usually specifically includes Will Scarlet or Scarlock, who is marked out by dressing in red, which is a pretty bad choice for a bandit hiding out in the woods, but nonetheless and Much the Miller's Son. And Much is a more minor character, but he's, interestingly, he's the only one who gives any hint as to his background. He's the son of a miller. So those appear in the early stories and repeat all through the mythos. Other characters, like I said, such as Friar Tuck and Alan Adale, come in a bit later, after 1500, and then eventually the female character of Maid Marian. 
And among the outlaw band, there is a broad sense of equality, that they all give a certain degree of respect to one another. No one is a slave or a servant, but they do all recognize Robin as their leader or master. And there is, you can say, a clear through line of homosociality. It's what a modern scholar would call homosocial. It's uh, their world is a world of emotional bonding and often intimacy among men, which may or may not have sexual undertones. There is a complete lack of women in the early Robin Hood mythos. In fact, no women are ever referred to by name anywhere in the early Robin Hood stories. The only female characters that play any role at all are the sheriff's wife in Robin Hood and the Potter, who has arguably a little sort of flirtation with Robin Hood, and the knight's wife, who is able to warn and summon Robin Hood to help the the knight, Richard of the Lee. So these are very small, but generally positive roles. There is no appearance of any interest at all in women as wives, lovers, or otherwise. And this leaves the relationships among the men as sort of ambiguous. Arguably, the ballad composers avoided bringing in any women because that might bring up problems and dilemmas of what's going to happen to these women and are they, are they going to marry one of the men? Is there going to be a love triangle? All of that is completely absent from the early Robin Hood stories. And you can see in this sort of homosocial environment, there are, you could say, pairings, particularly Robin Hood and Little John, who are particularly close and who at times behave kind of like a couple. There's clearly an emotional bond between them and also occasional friction and spats that seem almost like lovers' quarrels. And in fact, if you look at Robin Hood and the Monk, which is the earliest surviving ballad, The main arc of the story is actually the relationship of Robin Hood and Little John, where initially they have a breakup. They have a fight because they place a bet on an archery contest and Robin refuses to pay up. So they have a fight, they split up, but then Little John helps rescue them and at the end they make up. Uh, Little John says, well, now that I've saved you, I've discharged my duty and I'm going to leave the band now. And Robin Hood is distraught and says, no, you can't leave. You can be leader. You can take my place as commander. And Little John, of course, is moved and they make up and he stays with the group. So you could say there's there's something like there's an atmosphere and tone to the relationship that comes across kind of like a couple. But meanwhile, of course, there is no hint at all of femininity or effeminacy. The Robin Hood and his men also clearly represent virility, and their great prowess in hunting is has a kind of virile sexual overtone to it, the phallic symbol of the arrow. And of course, there is no explicit romantic or sexual link among any of the characters at all in the whole mythology other than the married couples. And in Robin Hood's world, instead, you see this overarching ideal and mood of fellowship. And the characters and the narrators constantly refer to the men as fellows or good fellows and to their relationships as good fellowship. And the band has a size of about 100 to 140 men when it is mentioned in the ballads how big the group it is. It's somewhere a little bit above 100. And that is pretty realistic for bandit groups. That was enough men for them to be able to defend themselves in a fight or a skirmish, but not too much to be able to feed and support in a forest. And so it does seem consonant with real outlaw bands. But also when you consider that they're united in fellowship, that there are these repeated references to St. Mary as a kind of patron saint, It's also very reminiscent of the small religious and monastic fellowships that were common and that were held up as an ideal in the late Middle Ages. The fellowship can be seen as similar to a guild or a confraternity with devotion to the patron saint. And also it is compared at times to a monastery. The men are evidently celibate. As I said, there's no reference at all to romance or sex. They're withdrawn from the ordinary world. They live an austere lifestyle in the wilds, basically. They don't have the luxuries of settled, civilized life. They have no servants. 
And at one point in the jest of Robin Hood, it's it's made pretty explicit where they take the sheriff captive and they take away his fine clothes and he's forced to sleep for the night in sort of plain clothes on the bare ground. And he absolutely hates this, right? It's like a princess and the pea moment. But Robin teases him and Robin says to the sheriff, cheer up, sheriff, for by God's charity, this is how we live under the greenwood tree. And the sheriff says, this is a harder way to live than any hermit or friar. So he's specifically comparing the life of these outlaws to that of, of churchmen, of holy men who live ascetically. But he says that they've, they've even exceeded them. So there's this added hint of kind of the sanctity of this outlaw fellowship. And the irony of this contrast between Robin Hood's band and men of the church is clearly intentional because one of the big striking overarching themes of the whole Robin Hood mythos as we see it from the Middle Ages is anti-clericalism. The stories in general, although they have a kind of humorous and jocular tone at some points, they are also animated by an intense hatred of the church, particularly of the clergy who fail to live up to the ideals of charity, austerity, and piety. And the main target of Robin Hood's animus all through the early legend, apart from the sheriff, who is kind of his natural opponent, his main target is rich, pampered monks and abbots. And there is constant implied contrast between the actual austerity and charity and generosity of Robin Hood and his men, as opposed to these hypocritical, wealthy, pampered, greedy monks who are concerned with worldly affairs and wealth. And so it's not surprising that monks are repeatedly mocked and robbed in the jest of Robin Hood, and also one is brutally and graphically killed in Robin Hood and the Monk. And furthermore, it's a known fact to people in the outside world that Robin Hood specifically hates wealthy monks. And this is one of, you could say, one of his weaknesses. And that's why at the end of A Jest of Robin Hood, when the king is struggling to catch Robin, a forester tells him that he should dress like an abbot and that that will naturally lure Robin out. He won't be able to resist attacking or abducting an abbot. Now, this hatred of hypocritical monks is not only on the part of Robin, the character, but also, you can say, on the part of the composers and shapers of the ballads. And this is emphasized in a scene of the jest of Robin Hood back at, towards the beginning, when the poor knight goes to repay his debt to the Abbey of St. Mary's, which was a real Benedictine monastery in York. And this scene is specifically set up to show the greed and duplicity of the monks. So the knight has to go to a court with, presided over by a judge and argue against this wealthy, powerful abbot who has lent him money and now wants to seize his lands. And the knight has the money to repay the debt at this point, but he plays a little game of subterfuge to show how hypocritical the abbot is. So rather than saying, I have your money and the debt is discharged, instead he first asks for an extension. And the abbot and the judge both refuse, and the abbot insists on seizing the knight's land. But then when the knight produces the cash and puts it out on the table, the abbot is upset and dismayed which shows how his whole motivation has been hypocritical all along. He did not make the loan in the first place in order to help out an impoverished knight in a time of need. He made the loan in the hope that it would be defaulted on and he would get his hand on those lands. And it shows the abbot as just greedy and, and hungry for power and property. And furthermore, once he, this, the debt is paid off, the abbot furiously turns to the judge and says, well, you have to give me my bribe back. And the judge refuses. And the implication here is that the abbot had paid off and bribed the judge in order to take his side in any dispute. But now that the debt is paid off anyway, it's a moot point. The abbot wants his money back. 
but the judge says no. And there's it's a little comic scene where he they are both exposing openly their own corruption. So the whole story shows a disgust for hypocritical, greedy clergy and judges and justices. And it seems that there is some historical basis to this story. As I mentioned before, there are episodes and aspects to these early stories that point towards the 1200s or early 1300s. And it happens that in the 1200s, there was a social crisis where many gentry families, especially sort of nightly minor gentry families became very impoverished and had to mortgage their lands to church bodies that had accumulated far more wealth and often defaulted and lost their properties and even fell out of the noble class. So the church at this point was the only significant source of credit, right? Apart from the small population of Jews who eventually were expelled in the 1290s, People had to turn to the church for credit, and the church often, church bodies often leveraged this to gain more wealth, more land, more property, and naturally resentment and bitterness built up, especially on the part of this minor gentry class against the church. And it happens that this specific monastery that is named in the jest is St. Mary's Abbey of York, which was a major landowner that did in fact accumulate enormous estates around York and sometimes came into conflict with nearby towns as they sort of gobbled up territory and butted heads with independent townships that didn't want to be under the control of the church. So all in all, this story probably represents both the minor nobilities and also the yeoman class's resentment towards the church, which they saw as sucking up land and hoarding wealth and power and prestige, all of which they could do without fighting, right? Whereas knights went into combat and whereas archers could be summoned and mustered for the king's wars, the church didn't have that duty and yet they were seen as gobbling up resources. And finally, this scene of the denial of the loan extension to the knight dramatizes, it underscores this underlying irony of how unlike Mary, he and his monks are. Whereas Mary is giving and yielding, whereas she says, you know, let it be, this monk says no and tries to take everything he can. And so it it emphasizes this irony also of the contrast between the churchmen and the outlaws, who in a way, in this view, are more genuinely Christian than the monks. And the hatred and, and cynical distrust towards the church is then finally also underscored in the story of how Robin Hood dies, which is briefly recounted at the end of the jest and then elaborated on in Robin Hood's death, where he goes to the prioress of Kirklees, who should be doubly trustworthy because she is a kinswoman of Robin and she is a woman of the church, and yet she betrays and kills him. And you can see the final scene where she's draining out Robin Hood's blood leading to his death. This you could see as a kind of sick, sinister reversal of giving birth, as St. Mary does, and also of the Eucharist, where one the Christian takes in the blood of Christ. Here, a churchwoman is draining Robin Hood's blood out. So there's this, you could say, very deep-seated theme of animus towards the church. Now, all of this is not to say that the stories or the character of Robin Hood are irreligious or impious. Rather, The ballads and the jest present Robin Hood as a devout Christian, and in particular as a fanatical devotee of the Virgin Mary. So as I mentioned, he prays repeatedly to St. Mary, and at one point in the ballad of Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne, it seems that he is saved by her intercession, all of which would have been fairly normal in the belief system of late medieval Christianity. Also, the plotline of Robin Hood and the monk is first set in motion because Robin insists on going to pray at church and give his devotions to St. Mary at Nottingham, and it happens that the main church in Nottingham was dedicated to St. Mary. Now, some scholars and commentators have said that in this way, Robin Hood is a conventionally pious Christian, but 
I disagree with that. I think that Robin Hood's devotion to St. Mary crosses a line into what would have been considered unconventional or even heretical. And there are repeated hints that Robin Hood actually places the Virgin Mary above Jesus Christ himself. For instance, at the beginning of the jest, we're told that Robin Hood habitually heard three masses a day. He must have had some chaplain, maybe that was Friar Tuck, but regardless, he hears three masses a day, which obviously is a lot. And they are dedicated to the Father, the Holy Ghost, and quote, our dear lady whom he loved the most. And you could see this as a sort of odd distortion of the Trinity. The Trinity is supposed to be the Father, the Son, meaning Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Yet in Robin Hood's devotions, Christ has been swapped out for St. Mary, almost creating like a new different Trinity. This is then underscored later when Robin Hood is in discussions with the knight and offers him a loan. But he asks the knight for a surety, a guarantee of repayment. And the knight says he has nothing to offer as a surety except his oath on Jesus Christ. And Robin Hood sort of laughs at this and rejects it as a joke, naturally. So the knight then says, well, I have nothing else except our dear lady. And Robin then responds to that positively and says, in all England, there is no better sponsor. So whereas he doesn't consider Christ a sufficient guarantor to the loan, St. Mary, he does. And this sort of lays out explicitly that Robin Hood elevates Mary over Christ in his theology. And medievalists maybe can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that this would be considered unconventional, if not heretical, in the 15th century. And it raises the question of why. What is the meaning? What is the point of this special connection to St. Mary, which appears in all the early ballads? Maybe St. Mary was understood as a sort of surrogate family, a substitute mother or wife figure, which he is lacking in this world of men. Maybe a surrogate female conf companion. But there may be other religious or spiritual meanings, too, that fit into the themes of the Robin Hood story and the setting in the Greenwood. I'm going to leave that till later rather than get into it now. And as you probably know, later on in the 1500s, the association with St. Mary was dropped. And probably this was because of the changing religious norms, where the cult of the saints and veneration of the saints went out of fashion. And particularly after the Reformation, it was seen as religiously suspect and associated with Catholicism, which was an outlaw religion from Queen Elizabeth's time onward. And so, not surprisingly, with that element missing, Maid Marian was then brought into the story as a fairly obvious substitute. So if we put aside for the moment the fact that there is a hint of religious heterodoxy in the Robin Hood stories, what then about the simple social and class meaning of the stories? Is he somehow a representation of peasant rebellion or something else? Well, as I've said before, Robin Hood himself and his men are repeatedly named as yeomen, and this theme is really emphasized and celebrated. They're sometimes called good yeomen. And what is a yeoman? Well, the word was used in late medieval English basically to mean a free man of sort of middling status not wealthy or respectable enough quite to be a gentleman, but certainly better than a mere peasant or husbandman. And originally at root, it just means young man. And so it probably initially referred to people starting out in life who had enough of their own income or enough marketable skills to be independent and support themselves. And often today when we use the term, we think of a small landholder, someone with enough land to be able to sell some on the market and support himself. But probably in the 1400s, when these stories were written, the main most common usage of the word yeoman was for a well-paid servant, 
in a noble or aristocratic household or in the royal household. So these men who were called yeomen were usually skilled. They were freeborn. Some of them were the younger sons from noble families who had a certain respectable status but did not inherit the noble title. And they tended to do respectable, skilled work, maybe as butlers, as messengers, groundkeepers. Especially a lot of them were guards or bodyguards, and they were expected to have some fighting ability. And also, in particular, many yeomen in the employ of noble lords or the crown were foresters. That was a common line of work for yeomen, to the point that in some people's views who lived out in the countryside, it was almost synonymous, yeoman and forester. And so these foresters would tend to the plantings and the game in a specially reserved forest. And a forest was a legal term. It didn't just mean a wooded land like we say today. It meant a special reserve where plants, trees, and game were reserved for a particular owner or patron. And many of the forests around England were specifically royal, set aside for the king and his retinue to hunt. So a yeoman forester had to be a master of archery and of hunting. And he could hunt game himself to bring to his patron, or he could oversee and manage hunts for his lord. And there was, it seems, a special sort of pride and respectability attaching to foresters and their specialized knowledge, including their archery skills. And foresters stood out in many people's eyes as sort of the most striking and distinctive and interesting variety of yeoman. And you can see a striking similarity between the character of the yeoman that is described in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and Robin Hood and his men. So in the Canterbury Tales, which were written in the late 1300s, so not too long before the earliest Robin Hood ballads, The forester is described by Chaucer as dressed all in green, carrying a horn, much like the one that Robin Hood has and blows to summon his men. He also carries various weapons, including a bow and a quiver of arrows with peacock feathers. And this is very reminiscent, then, of the jest of Robin Hood, where Robin Hood receives from the knight a gift of arrows with peacock feathers. And in fact, the descriptions are often so close that printers who published the early stories of Robin Hood in the 1500s recognized the similarity and often reused illustrations depicting the forester in the Canterbury Tales as images of Robin Hood. So they were so close that they could even be kind of visually indistinguishable. And this suggests that Robin Hood as he's described in the early stories, would have been easily recognized by audiences as a yeoman forester. He basically fits that persona. The twist is just that Robin Hood in the stories does not serve any master. He's not a paid servant of a duke or a king. Rather, he is an outlaw and he claims the forest and animals for himself. So he's sort of a yeoman forester who's been decontextualized, who's been taken out of the customary social hierarchy and set up as kind of his own master in the Greenwood. So all of that being said, you still might suppose nonetheless that the main audience for the tales to whom it was supposed to appeal were peasants, just general illiterate commoners. But recent scholars have disputed that, as I said, and they insist that the early audience was probably also composed of yeomen, and the tales were probably first written and composed by skilled literate minstrels who could perform stories and songs, and often would perform grand tales and romances like Arthurian romances or the Song of Roland for aristocratic households at big events, entertainments, weddings, things like that. But that doesn't mean that that's all that they would perform. These traveling minstrels who went from household to household or fair to fair also might perform more kind of common, ribald, low-brow stories and songs aimed at the larger household, not just at the lords and ladies, but the majority of the residents of a household, which were the servants. And 
among the servants, those who had the most money and ability to, say, tip and patronize these minstrel performers were yeomen. So the stories of Robin Hood were probably aimed at this audience of yeoman servants, and they celebrate their skills in fighting, in archery, and hunting, and it shows, the stories do show some awareness of high romances and chansons de geste, like the Arthur tales, but they translate them, for one thing, into, into English. They are, in a way, you could say more accessible, more relatable to the lower status men of the household. And so current scholars argue that the ballads were most likely aimed at them and that they were performed at gatherings, dinners, parties, things like this. Maybe also then later at taverns or inns. That was a common life cycle that a ballad might first be composed for a courtly audience or an aristocratic audience, and then it would make its way out on the roads to the inns and taverns. And you can tell there's actually evidence in the text that... This is how the stories first were composed as these live performances at gatherings because several of them begin with invocations saying, everyone be quiet and listen up to this story. So it makes sense that the, this would have been the conventional opening when you're in, let's say, a busy great hall of a manor house or maybe in a tavern, people are talking and you want to call people to attention and say, I'm going to perform a story of Robin Hood. So that's how many of the ballads begin. And they were most likely aimed at, firstly, at this yeoman audience that didn't know French, that would have wanted to hear stories in English, and that would have wanted to hear the kind of stories they like about fighting, about archery, about independence and defiance. And so they developed this figure of Robin Hood, who is the ideal yeoman, who also enjoys freedom in the Greenwood, who is not under the watchful eye of some lord or employer. So you can see probably these stories had certain social functions in the 1400s. They were likely an expression or an outlet for a feeling of resentment towards masters and other undeserving superiors like church, church prelates. And they provide a sort of dream, a sort of fantasy escapism of greater independence where the yeoman lives out of the shadow of his employers. And further, they also were a vehicle for developing a distinctive code of honor and good conduct for the yeoman. So there you can see a kind of group, almost like a class consciousness of the yeomanry expressed in these stories. And they put Robin, as I said, outside of civilization without a master. And that allowed the audience to then think about a yeoman in the abstract. What did it mean? It, it served as a meditation for what it meant to be a yeoman and what ideals one should emulate as a yeoman, apart from merely discharging one's duties of employment and service to a lord. So you can see a sort of yeomanly code of ethics being developed in the Robin Hood stories that serve to mirror or mimic the knightly code of ethics or chivalry that one sees in the chivalric romances. So in the same way that you can see the stories as a kind of more popular or more informal middle-brow mimicry of the chivalric romances, in the same way they put forward a sort of more common, more down-to-earth yeomanly ethics. And you can see this spelled out almost explicitly in the ballads. For example, in Robin Hood and the Potter, Robin Hood, of course, detains and fights the Potter, and the Potter objects and says that this is not courteous to hold a good yeoman captive. And Robin then agrees. He recognizes the point, and he says, you speak good yeomanry. So he's almost saying there is like a set of ethical principles that can be called yeomanry like mimicking the idea of chivalry. And at the end of the poem, it closes with a prayer saying, quote, God have mercy on Robin Hood's soul and save all good yeomanry. And there's this kind of interesting ambiguity here. Does yeomanry mean a set of morals and behavior or does it mean a class, a group of people, all good yeomanry, meaning all the, the collectivity of yeomen? And furthermore, in Robin Hood's alliance with the knight Richard of the Lee, which is one of the through lines in the jest of Robin Hood, 
you can see that as symbolizing a sort of sympathy between yeomanry and chivalry, where maybe the yeoman recognizes and perceives that the knightly chivalric class is falling into poverty and irrelevance, which we know was happening in the late Middle Ages. Chivalry was outmoded and many knights were falling into penury. And the yeoman in this way maybe is stepping forward and saying, we sympathize and we are going to take up and adapt and continue on a new kind of sense of honor that is our own adaptation of chivalry into yeomanry, into the, the code of honor that can reasonably be practiced by a yeoman who has no higher skill than archery. So what does this ethical code consist in? What is good yeomanry, according to Robin Hood and his men? Well, it has four basic elements to it. Firstly, courtesy. And courtesy means generosity and open-handedness, which Robin Hood displays. Robin Hood takes freely, but he also gives and lends freely to his friends and associates. And it also means polite behavior, the appropriate sort of politeness and forbearance, especially towards peers and towards guests. So there's a strong element of hospitality. And for instance, when a monk is brought into Robin Hood's lair, Robin removes his hood, but the monk does not do so. And that's considered rude. So Robin is revealing his face, his identity, but the monk does not follow suit. So Robin Hood says, well, this is simply a churl who has no knowledge of courtesy. Secondly, fighting prowess, but within strict bounds and limits. So it's good to be a strong fighter and to be aggressive, but you limit your choice of targets. So Robin Hood says he will not fight women or children or the poor. Near the opening of the jest, there is a little speech where Robin lays out whom they can legitimately attack. And he says, quote, see that ye do no husband harm. So this means a, a husbandman, like a small farmer. See that you do no husband harm that tills with his plow, nor any good yeoman that walks by Greenwood Hollow, nor any knight or squire that will be a good fellow. These bishops and these archbishops, them shall ye beat and bind, the high sheriff of Nottingham, hold him in your mind. So there is a sort of class consciousness here, right? But he's, he's not talking about whom they should help. He's just talking about whom they can legitimately attack. And at the top of his list, of course, are churchmen and the sheriff of Nottingham. And furthermore, Robin Hood explains some of his reasoning for these limits, and he explicitly connects women to St. Mary. The jest says that, quote, Robin loved our dear lady. For fear of deadly sin, he would never do company harm that any woman was in. Now, thirdly, possibly the most important element in this yeomanly code of ethics is honesty. Robin Hood repeatedly insists on candor and truth-telling. As I mentioned before, he keeps taking captives and asking how much money they have on their person as a way of testing their honesty, and he then takes whatever is left over as a kind of punishment. And in this way, he plays a role kind of like folkloric fairies who monitor and test people. And he also has a fanatical obsession with keeping promises. And if you look at the plotline of the jest, he, his quest against the sheriff of Nottingham is not driven by any sense that the sheriff is inherently evil or a tyrant. It's just that the sheriff broke his promise to leave Robin Hood alone in the woods. So this is his main criterion for judging people's ethics. Do, do they tell the truth and keep their promises also, the, the stories, you could say, kind of honor this principle in the breach. They show how Robin Hood himself falls short. So again, in Robin Hood and the Monk, Robin and Little John fall into a fight because Robin Hood fails to honor a bet that he made with Little John. And this rift is what then leaves Robin Hood vulnerable and allows him to be captured. And in the end, you could see the story as teaching Robin Hood a lesson and pointing out to, to the audience as well that this is his ultimate error and possibly his undoing if he fails to adhere to this ultimate principle of honor. And lastly, there's a sort of overall spirit of equity 
where Robin Hood freely recognizes the worth and potential in others, regardless of their status or station. And there's this pattern that appears a bit in the early stories and then develops much more in the later ones, in the 1500s, a pattern where Robin meets his match. He encounters some other character, fights them, then calls a truce, pays respect and homage to their ability, and then invites them into the group. And Robin Hood does this with the potter in Robin Hood and the Potter. And Little John also does so with the cook when he fights the cook in the sheriff's household. And then, of course, in later stories, it repeats. The theme repeats with other characters like the Pinder of Wakefield and even sometimes with Maid Marian. In some versions, that's how Marian joins the group. So there's this sort of open recognition of the freedom of other men and of their ability to choose whether or not to live the life of the outlaw. And this sort of spirit of of equity is ultimately driven home at the end of Robin Hood and the Monk, when Robin doesn't want Little John to leave, and he offers Little John the leadership of the group and says, you can replace me. And in this way, he's making at least a gesture of recognizing the value and the equality of others around him. So I think that the yeomanly audience of the original stories probably gave shape to this sort of understanding of a new ethics based on courtesy, fighting prowess, honesty, and equity. And it also helps to explain what I would see as the literary significance and the innovative nature of these stories. The fact that they are long narrative poems rhyming which is the French style, the Romantic style, but in English and accessible to a wider English-speaking audience, fewer and fewer of whom knew any French. So it's sort of a new type of romance, you could say, for this new middling sort, this yeoman sort, that in a way serves as both an adaptation and a sort of mirror parody of the Arthurian mythos. And this ambiguity is reflected even in the title, a jest of Robin Hood, which on the one hand is a reference back to the chanson de geste, the songs of great deeds or great acts of knights or heroes, but also, of course, in English, the word jest also means joke. So there's this double meaning even in that title. And as others have pointed out, you can see odd sort of parallels between the setups of Robin stories and Arthur stories, such as at the beginning of the jest, where Robin is ready to hold a feast, but before they can begin, he demands that they must hear an adventure story before they begin to eat. And so they have to go out and basically abduct this knight and bring him in to the forest lair. And this mimics Arthurian stories, such as, for example, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which begins with the Christmas festivities at Camelot, where they're not allowed to begin feasting until they hear a story of adventure. And Arthur then sort of, you could say, calls forth this the beginning of this adventure story. In this way, you could see Robin Hood as kind of a people's Arthur, right? A sort of figure who swaps in for Arthur at the same time that he's his opposite, right? He's a kind of master of mischief and misrule, the opposite of the dignified King Arthur who brings order and peace. So it's, it's a kind of funhouse mirror version of Arthuriana that is more rough and tumble, more irreverent, and that in certain very significant ways are realistic. There is a remarkable realism to the Robin Hood mythos. Although he you know, has these extraordinary abilities and he's a master of disguise and he gets into madcap schemes, nonetheless, the basic plot lines are based on real outlaw activities, highway robbery, abduction, violence. There are even scenes that are pretty brutal, such as in particular the scene in Robin Hood and the Monk, where little John kills and beheads the monk of St. Mary's, and then much the miller's son summarily kills and beheads his young page, who's an innocent boy or youth. And this sort of scene can strike us today as quite shocking or abhorrent, but it is also realistic. This is the sort of thing that outlaw bands 
did and had to do. They had to do things like kill witnesses in order to protect themselves and persist in the Greenwood. So there is a kind of unflinching realism to it. There's also pretty realistic depiction of corrupt law courts and sheriffs that were owned by regional interests. That was not at all unusual in the late Middle Ages, and it was even, you could say, the norm earlier in the 1200s, as I'll talk about more later. But that also is pretty realistic, if sometimes kind of dramatized or exaggerated. The stories also take place in real settings. Although the North is sort of idealized and seen through these southern eyes, nonetheless, the locations are real. Barnsdale is a real place. There are remarkable geographic details that connect the stories to specific places along the Great North Road, as is also Nottingham and Sherwood Forest. And beyond all of this, there is an overriding metaphysical realism, at least what we today would see as realism. Throughout the Arthur mythos, there is no magic, no sorcery, no bewitchment. There is at one point a hint of a kind of prophecy in a prophetic dream, but it nothing necessarily magical. There are no fantastical creatures or monsters. So unlike in other grand chivalric stories of outlaw rebels, he doesn't go fight a giant bear or a dragon or anything like that. In all of these ways, the Robin Hood mythology is very different from the romances that might have inspired it. And that, again, also raises the question of why. Why do these stories stand out as metaphysically so different? It must be in some way because of who composed them and for what audiences. So late medieval Roman audiences maybe found magic and sorcery to be cliché or pompous, something in tied up in distant or unrelatable stories of kings and knights. And we have to recognize, for one thing, a certain fact about how people compose stories, where each mythos, each myth- mythological world where a group of stories take place, tends to have its own rules and its own kind of metaphysical structure. And the Greenwood, where these Robin Hood stories take place, is different. It's a place that would have been more familiar, more vivid, more tangible to these audiences than, say, Camelot or Avalon. And the Greenwood in itself is very mysterious and romantic. It brings a certain atmosphere. Still, nonetheless, to the Robin Hood audience, magic would have felt out of place. It might have felt like excessive or somehow spoiling the, the fun of Robin Hood's real, brutal, irreverent, vivid stories. There's also another possible reason why the metaphysics of Robin Hood's world is so simplified and so pared down as compared to the chivalric romances. And that's the fact, as I've mentioned before, that the ballads are very clearly linked from early on to theatrical performance. We know for certain that there were people dressing up and performing as Robin Hood, at least by the 1480s. There's also that play fragment that survives, as I mentioned, from the early 1470s, maybe about 1472. And so these are early indications that Robin Hood was a person to be personified, to be impersonated as part of a show or a pageant. And it may be that that goes back all the way to the earlier years, the earlier unknown stages in the development of the legend. Maybe he was always an impersonated, performed character. And in this way, it might make sense that narratives like the jest and the ballads were actually composed to be performed or recited in conjunction with pantomime performances. So you would actually see the action going on, acted out as you were hearing the story. At least that seems very plausible. And this makes them very different from the chivalric romances, which were read or recited, not performed theatrically. And this makes sense, too, because romances were high art, high literature for... uh, highbrow audience, usually a French-speaking audience, and theater, on the other hand, was considered low or lewd entertainment. So Robin Hood 
is linked to the theater in a way that Arthur and the other romantic heroes were not. And this background in performance is reflected in the style of the ballads, where there are these repeated short lines of dialogue, sometimes running through large chunks of the ballads, which sound almost like play dialogue, like little scenes to be acted out. The ballads also have very minimal description. There is no long poetic discourse on the beauty of Sherwood Forest or the the beautiful high walls of Nottingham Castle, right? There's none of that. Uh, There's no long involved discussion of any person's appearance. We really don't know what any of them looked like based on the ballads. There's no physical description of their faces or their bodies. Really all we know is that little John is big. And all of this makes sense for one thing if you consider that you were supposed to be seeing people acting out these characters. You didn't need a description, and in fact, that could only just get in the way if the actor didn't match the text. (laughs) And instead, what you find in the ballads is just quick, vivid, concrete images, like small objects with colors. Uh, The monk is carrying a letter or a seal. There are arrows with peacock feathers. And these come across sometimes almost like stage directions, indicating costumes and props as they show up on stage. You know, Robin is in Lincoln Green, Little John is carrying a staff, the sheriff wears furs, the abbot has a big purse full of money, etc., etc. And so it may be that these ballads and stories were written to be easy to stage, and hence they don't have any of these extravagances of the earlier romances. There are no dragons, no ladies emerging from lakes and presenting swords. There are just simple everyday objects, actions, and gestures that can be easily performed or pantomimed. And this may then explain further why they have translated so easily into film and television. They are easy to stage. Forest setting, bows and arrows, green cloth. This is something that any theatrical troop should be able to pull off and indeed often did pull off even without a theater you can perform these plays outdoors in a village or a parish so robin hood in this way i think it emerged from a certain kind of middling status milieu in the late middle ages and created a kind of literature that could be easily picked up and reproduced for modern audiences So I'm going to leave off there and leave to later a discussion of other important themes in the stories. The theme of the outlaw, what it meant to be an outlaw, the attitude to authority and power, and the meaning of the setting, the symbolism of the Greenwood, and the resonances that you can see between Robin Hood and characters like, say, the Green Knight, who also emerges from the forest. So there are a lot of parallels there, and those speak, I think, ultimately to the final question that I'll discuss, which is, where did the Robin Hood story start? Was there a real outlaw bandit called Robin Hood? Is he a literary creation? Is he a mythological creature who has been transformed into a human? Uh, All of these, I think, are possibilities, but I will leave those discussions then for the later half, which I will put on Patreon for patrons only. So if you want to hear that, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description. Become a supporter at any level, even if it's just a dollar. Thank you.